thanks for joining today. Um, this is really exciting. Um, the IGS seminar or global seminar series has been running online since April 2020. Tavi Murray and Magnus have been running it. Um, it's to date mostly focused on glaciology. Um, so a few months ago, myself, Alec Petty, and Petra Heil were talking about how great it would be to add sea ice and add an online sea ice seminar. We met with Tavi and Magnus, and they were receptive to our idea of, of including sea ice in the global seminar series and uh, have welcomed us in with, uh, with open arms. So moving forward once a month, we're gonna feature two sea ice talks during one of, the, um, one of the global seminar series, which take place every Wednesday afternoon or every Wednesday, varying time zones, of course. Um, and so, yeah, this is our first one. So we're starting today with two presentations from Walt Meyer at NSIDC and Ellen Buckley, who's now at Brown. Um, in the coming weeks, we're going to have a second sea ice session on October 26th, featuring Letty Roach and Kent Moore. And then at the end of November, we're going to have talks by Vishnu Nandan, who is a postdoc here at the University of Manitoba, and Will Hobbs, who is down in Tasmania, is going to be presenting on Antarctic sea ice. Uh, just before we start, I wanted to, um, to just say that the idea for this series is that the talks are all based on people volunteering to give talks. And we're open to any topic related to sea ice. I've been receiving some grief from some of my friends about how this is a little physics focused to start. And I think that's just the result of myself and Alec and Petra being sea ice physicists. Um, but we are open to biology, chemistry, all aspects of sea ice. So if you see a topic that you are involved with and you don't see it covered in the seminar series, please feel free to email us and volunteer to give a talk or connect us with students or other people from your group who would be willing to give talks and, uh, and we'll work with them to schedule. We are currently scheduling talks into 2023. Um, our plan is to continue the once per month uh, format. We also want to encourage uh, students and early career scientists to present. So today we have Ellen who just recently defended her PhD giving a talk. Uh, and we also want to try to include both a, a global coverage of, of speakers, but also maintain the gender diversity um, that TV has established in this series. So um, please feel free to, uh, to distribute information about this seminar series to people in your group, uh, interesting papers you read, things like that, and, uh, and we'll carry forward. And of course, all of this leads into the IGS CA Symposium that is happening next June in Germany. And uh, I've talked to Christian Haas, who is the chair of that meeting, and we will get a slide that will start to advertise that, that meeting during these talks. So that's enough from me. So today we're gonna to start, start with Walt Meyer, who is gonna give us an overview of sea ice conditions during 2022. And then Ellen is gonna talk a little bit more about how we observe sea ice during summer using altimeters. So Walt, I will pass it over to you. All right, thank you. Sure. Oh, and maybe before we start, I'll just say we'll save questions for the end of the presentation. So if people would like to add questions in the chat or use the raise hand function, I'll moderate the questions at the end and uh, and we can work our way through it that way. OK, thanks. Uh, thanks, Dave. And thanks, Alec, uh, for inviting me or asking me to volunteer. <laughs> um, happy to do so. Um, uh, so I, I'm going to give a, a talk here on kind of just a recap of our of the previous this past summer for Arctic sea ice. Um, we just published our Arctic sea ice news and analysis post yesterday. Um, so this will be a summary of that. Folks can go check out um, that at, at NSIDC's uh, website if you want to read more. Um, as we kind of were looking at this and, and I was looking at this, um, there were some things that seemed kind of odd about the, the summer. Um, so we started using the term an odd summer. And but then as as we kind of got towards the end of the summer and, and looked at things and realized that, you know, yeah, it's maybe it's odd, but it seems like all the summers are odd <laughs> um, now and it, each in their own way, at least compared to earlier decades. So odd may not be the best word to use, but I kept the title. Um, so uh, anyway. Moving on, uh, the uh, minimum, we reached the minimum in uh, on September 18th, um, a little bit later than normal. Normal is about uh, September 12th, and it reached the 10th lowest. Um, but it was a little bit of a, 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 
a you know an even ice extent loss uh, trend through the summer. It was fairly slow in August. We actually, if you look, um, you can see that the cursor here. We actually touched the inner decile lower level inner decile range for the 81 to 2010 mean. So that's relatively high compared to most recent years. Um, and 2022 ended up, like I said, 10th lowest, again, higher than a lot of recent years, uh, but but lower than last year. Um, and so it certainly was an, an extreme year. Um, looking at the monthly uh, trend, it's in September, um, and again, you can see, you know, compared to some of the recent years, uh, this, you know, the end of the time, oops, oh, yeah, sorry, time series here, um, a little bit higher, but slightly lower than last year. The overall trend is pretty consistent over the time series, and it stayed around 80,000 square kilometers per year. Um, we were above the trend line these last two years, so um, that's, uh, you know, it happens from time to time, but um, again, relatively high. One of the things I think that's interesting that I've noticed starting even a couple of years ago, um, you know, 2007 kind of represents a, almost like a, a step down, a, a step change in the in the sea ice cover. If we look back to 2007, which of course was a record low at that time, um, it's pretty flat, um, just a very small downward trend. And so um, we've we're kind of entered this stage for the last um, 16 years now where there's a lot of variability, um, it's low, uh, it's certainly not recovering in any way, uh, any significant way for sure, um, but we're not seeing a, a continued downward trend. Now 16 years is pretty short, I wouldn't put too much into that. Um, there's a lot of variability, both from year to year and, and over e even decadal variability. So I don't think it's you know, necessarily, it certainly doesn't mean that, that <laughs> The uh, the sea ice decline has ended, but it's an interesting pause. I think there's you know things that that maybe look into there as to why that is. Um, I'll leave it there for for now in the interest of time. Um, I have some thoughts if folks want to chat about that or share things, but um, I, I think it is pretty interesting that it, we've had a fairly significant time now uh, without much trend. Um, looking at the summer and the atmospheric forcing over the summer. Um, it, it was a pretty, I would say, a pretty quiet summer. There were certainly some storms, um, and and in you know there was the big storm in Alaska this last month, um, but that was in the Bering without without much sea ice around. Um, within the Arctic, um, the temperatures were warm generally, um, but not as extreme as what we've seen in many other years. And the pressures um, were pretty moderate. Um, the Beaufort Gyre was not particularly strong for much of the summer. Um, there's not huge pressure gradients, so it was a, a fairly quiet summer uh, in the in the Arctic. Um, we didn't see a strong dipole uh, pattern like we've seen, like for example, in 2007. We didn't see a big strong cyclone come through into the sea ice like in 2012. Um, so it was uh, less extreme in the in the atmosphere. Um, some of the, the notable things that uh, that sort of lead me to call it somewhat odd um, was um, one of the things was we saw this slow ice loss in the ice in the East Siberian Sea. Um, the medium blue there is is um, where the uh, ice cover was on August 15th this year. And then underneath that in white is the um, is the 2020 just for comparison. And you can see, you know, in 2020, that area was completely open. Um, but this year we had a, a tongue of ice stretching all the way to the coast into mid August. Um, we've seen, you know, kind of extensions like that in the past. Um, but this one was, uh, I would say, somewhat unusual in that, you know, it stayed around even longer than, than what we've seen in the past. And that, that led to a late opening of the northern sea route um, compared to, to many previous years. Um, another thing that I think was pretty interesting is a, a area, what looks like in our standard uh, passive microwave data at 25 kilometers, kind of a low concentration area circled there in red, up pretty close to the pole, about 80, upwards of 86, 87 degrees latitude. Um, and again, it, it doesn't show it as ice free, but it shows it as pretty low concentration. Um, but if we look at higher resolution data, 
on the left is high high resolution, um, three kilometer resolution, actually using resolution enhancement um, to get more detail. And you can see the dark blue. Um, this is a brightness temperature difference. Um, and you can see the dark blue is indication of open water, whereas the green and the and the yellow shades are are ice. And there's definite uh, you know dark blue within that within that red circle there. And that again is up upwards of 87 degrees, maybe even 88 degrees north. Um, we can see this in the MODIS true color composite on the right, the visible imagery. And um, it's hard oftentimes to see much there because of the clouds, but we, there is a clear sky on, on August 18th, uh, at least reasonably clear. And you can definitely see again, open flows, uh, open water and uh, with flows in there. And that's, we've seen some low concentrations, but this to my mind is one of the more extreme uh, con low concentration areas in, in open water areas that far north. Um, another, uh, I think, interesting uh, uh, interesting thing is the Northwest Passage. In contrast to the Northern Sea Route, the Northwest Passage was was um, quite um, quite extreme in terms of ice free conditions. Even in the the Northern Route, um, which is through the Perry Channel, um, through um, the, the kind of main wide deep route channel. Um, it reached uh, the, the fourth lowest on record, according to uh, Steve Howell of, of uh, Canadian Ice Ser or Environment Canada and, and based on the Canadian Ice Service data, um, you know, went quite low, um, not quite as low as in 2011, but, but pretty clear of ice. Um, looking at the our MAZI imagery, which is high resolution um, analysis from the National Ice Center, there, there is some, some uh, groups of flows in the channel, but um, there's definitely uh, routes through there if one were if one were careful to avoid. You, you wouldn't have to ice break to get through um, this year. So I think that um, you know, on the northern sea route side and the and the Siberian side, more ice than than normal, at least relative to recent years. And then the Northwest Passage, less ice than normal. Um, we have our sea ice age product where we track the ice over time with Lagrangian tracking and ice motion. And so we keep track, we look at that regularly and, and um, looking at 1985 on the top to 2012, you, you really see the dramatic change, the loss of the older uh, four plus year ice in red. Um, and you can see that in the time series in the on, on the left for the Arctic Ocean domain where um, it, the, you know, there's a big drop off in 2005 to 2008. Um, it's interesting here. I think that the multi-year ice has shown kind of a it, it's it's reached kind of about a about 1.5 million square kilometers, but it's kind of been oscillating around that. Um, hasn't really decreased again since 2007, and maybe that relates to the overall um, minimums that uh, you know, the, the multi-year ice is kind of uh, at least for now holding out. But the oldest ice, the four plus year old ice, greater than four years old, um, since 2012 has really um, almost disappeared. I mean, it's bouncing around um, at less than a half million square kilometers. Um, so a, a, a dramatic change from what we used to see in the past. Um, we now have at, at, at NSIDC, at the, at the NSIDC NASA Snow and Ice Stack, we're archiving the ISAT2 data um, and we have ISAT2 fields. Um, for a variety of parameters, including uh, monthly uh, freeboard uh, from Alec Petty, who led the development of this product. Um, and so we don't have it during the summertime, um, but we can look at the winter um, here, and it compares pretty well with the uh, with the ice age. Um, the multi-year ice shows the thicker ice areas. Um, one of the things we do see, um, just going back to here, there is this kind of time of second year ice, older, a little bit older ice that maybe held out the East Siberian sea area and led to the slower melt out. We don't see, I don't see as much of a hint. There's a little bit of a hint here, but it's not as prominent. But again, this is freeboard. Um, and so it may not, you know, there may be some differences there. And even in the ice age, it's not totally clear that there's a, you know, a lot of uh, secondary ice, at least extending to the coast. But again, um, I think there's general good correspondence between the the uh, the freeboard and the ice age. Um, and uh, the next uh, kind of moving on from the observations, I want to touch on on the on predictions a little bit. We have our sea ice prediction network, 
um, which we're in our second uh, second project for this sort of SIP in two um, to predict the September sea ice and to work uh, to kind of get a collaborative uh, effort amongst the community community effort to predict in, in the uh, September sea ice and try to try to improve uh, our efforts and improve the, the skills of, of the predictions. Uh, it started in 2008 as a really an ad hoc informal effort um, but uh, then we did receive funding it's been uh, primarily nsf funded but with uh, substantial support also from the the naval research lab or an onr i should say um, noaa and nasa and it's coordinated by arcus so it's a community effort um and you know, we we engage with stakeholders as well or try to the main thing that we do as folks are probably familiar with is the, the sea ice outlook which is where we do the arctic september um sea ice extent prediction um there are different methods that are that are submitted models statistical methods heuristic methods we also have citizen science entry so there's there's a hard science component physical science component to it but also somewhat of a, a, a community um outreach type of uh, component as well. So we encourage any groups to uh, to submit. We, we've had a regular submission from a, a school in Japan um, where the teacher uh, heads of students uh, put together uh, their predictions. Um, we've also expanded to regional uh, and Antarctic predictions as well. Um, so this is the 2022 outlook. Um, each of these bars represents a, a contribution. This, there was 37. Um, we it, it's expanded over the years. Um, over the last few years, we've been in the the mid to high 30s generally, um, and so it's it's a pretty broad community that's that's submitting. Um, and it's really nice to see this this effort. Um, the extent is on the x-axis, um, and the color codes are for the different methods. This is from um, the the median in June was was 4.57 million square kilometers. Um, we put the observed 2021 um, line on there for comparison. Um, we also uh, show these with box and whisker plots for the different methods, and you can see some variation there in in the the, the medians and then the spread between those. Um, that again is also in June. I won't show the other months. Um, in theory, the it should get better. Um, and should hone in and we actually did see that pretty well this year um that wasn't the case last year um but this year um things look pretty good um you know with each new month the we got closer to the to the actual observed extent in september which is 4.87 million square kilometers we also have um ed blanchard rigglesworth at university of washington and others uh work to get uh where there's spatial fields to um, compare. Um, so these are the, the sea ice probability fields. Um, so to go beyond just the simple uh, Pan-Arctic uh, extent number. Um, we have a proposal in to, to continue this. Um, this is, a, we are in the last year of the, the current project, um, but we're hoping to continue it, to continue the outlook, but also to expand and, and, and kind of work towards new objectives, um, expanding to other months, being more quantitative in our skill metrics, um, improving our observations and observation skill, uh, doing some hind cast evaluation and analysis, and also greater community engagement, uh, particularly with stakeholders, to to make the uh, these outlooks more valuable and more quantitative for for stakeholders. Um, one of the things that uh, looked at, you know, I, I've been sharing the NASA team algorithm product in the sea ice index, which is what we have as one of our primary products at at NSIDC, but that's far from the only product and I, I wouldn't claim that it's the best product. And in fact, I think one thing to do is to look at several different products. Um, so this is just an example of uh, six different products. Most of these are passive microwave data um, from either the SSMIS sensor or or 2 um, And you can see there's a pretty good spread amongst these. There's upwards of over 500,000 square kilometers. Um, difference between these. And that has to do with the different sensors, the different algorithms that are used, different ways of potentially defining the ice edge or how the different uh, sensors and channels used, um, how sensitive they are to ice near the ice edge. Um, but that kind of gives you a sense of what the observed 
uncertainty is in, in the in the ice edge and in the ice extent. Um, so it's important to keep in mind that again, even though oftentimes we quote a single number, there is there is variability there, um, and that should play into any kind of evaluation of predictions. Um, so kind of said that already. Um, let's hear you know, these different factors, and it does lead to the idea of what what is the true extent. Um, I just finish up real quick. Um, I, just a little bit of promotion here. We often do regional analyses. I didn't bother to show the regional analyses here. Um, we do have regional data um, based on um, region map, but uh, we actually have a new um, uh, region mass that we are going to be publishing soon. Um, much more flexible um, and more accurate than the currently used masks um, that are that have been distributed by NSIDC, developed by Claire Parkinson and others at NASA, and, and I, I adapted those a bit myself. Um, so that's going to be published. We, we did publish a paper that used these regions. Um, and so if folks are interested in these, let me know. Um, but they will be published um, fairly soon, and, and there'll be an announcement about that. We do have the Antarctic ones as well, um, including the, the older kind of standard mass. And then there was uh, Raphael and Hobbs, Marilyn and Raphael put together a, a, a study that showed that the regions, um, if they were adjusted a bit, would better capture the, the variability, um, uh, kind of consistent variability. So we actually have a version with that as well. So I will end there. Thank you. Great. Thanks so much, Walt. Uh, so we've got a few minutes for any questions. Uh, we've got our first one here from Trevor. Uh, I'll just read it off the chat. Thanks for the talk, Walt. How does mean September sea ice, thick, sea ice thickness vary year by year, and does it correlate with ice extent? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, and you know, Alec would probably be good to answer this too. But you know, we don't have a, as much thickness data. Um, you know, that's one of the rationales for using the ice age. Ice age does somewhat correl correlate, at least with the the thermodynamic thickness. The older ice is thicker ice. So we, when I showed that multi-year ice, that's that's some indication of of variability. Um, with the satellite data, um, we we are getting now um, a, a decent time series of of, of uh, thickness data directly from the satellite, the altimeters. ISAT two I showed. There's also Cryosat two, um, which is a, which has uh, estimates, and there's a Cryosat two SMOS ice volume product. Um, we I don't have that. You know I didn't put that in this talk in the interest of time. Um, we do see some variability. Um, there's also the biomass, which uses some modeling. To, uh, to estimate thickness. And there is definitely variability, um, but there's an overall declining trend. Um, and again, it kind of corresponds with the ice age where we see some really pretty dramatic drops in like 2005 and 2007. And it's been more steady over the last decade or so with uh, some variability, but not, not as much of a trend. Great, yeah, thanks, Walt. Uh, Ellen, you've got your hand up. Yeah, I guess a similar question. Um, have you looked at sea ice area, especially when there's, um, and like looked at the trends for that, especially when there's those areas of open water within the sea ice pack? Yeah, we have looked at that. Uh, the paper that I, I noted, we did look at area. Area is a little tougher to work with because, um, this, especially in the summertime, because the summer melt um, affects the concentration um, in the past from microwave data. So you tend to underestimate the concentration, and that will tend to underestimate the cause an underestimation in the area. And if, as we have more melt uh, at certain times of you know at certain times of year, that can bias your trends. So we tend to look at extent, um, but the the areas I, I would say you know show similar trends um, and, and and similar trend numbers. So. There's not a whole lot of difference on the area. It does give you these um, this um, open water. One of the things that um, uh, I've seen suggested, and uh, I think Joy Camiso has done, is to actually do like the overall concentration, like the area total area divided by total extent, um, and that can give you a sense of what the opening is within the ice cover. And I think this year would be interesting to look at with these with this open water. But you do have to worry about the melt and the effect on that um, that that can cause. Um, you don't know if you're looking at actual open water or or just a, a melt signal. Yeah. Yeah. 
that's a great um, lead into my talk <laughs> about yeah. melt. I was, I was going to say that, yeah. <laughs> Perfect. And we've got a few comments there from Alec and Maddie in the chat about some of that discussion. Uh, do we have any other questions? Yeah, we're just fighting about the direction of the correlation. That's fine. <laughs> yeah, and and I yeah I agree. You know the the thickness we we saw a really good correlation back you know 20, 2007 when it was looked at. It's becoming somewhat less so because the multi year is melting more and more. <laughs> um, so that's something we will look at again and hope to look at it again in the coming coming months. But um, yeah, it's, it's interesting. Yeah, it's also that multi year ice even though it still continues to exist sort of around that one and a half million square kilometer mark, like you said, uh, there's continuous observations that that multi ice pack itself is getting thinner, right? Especially as yeah. older ice types. It, it, there, there's some indication that, like I said, I've seen some of the cryosat time series and it's not showing as much of a downward trend. That may be more on, of the first year ice though, that still is, you know, in the winter time, that's more of the winter time, um, and the winter thickness. So I think there is some thinning in the multi-year ice um, and continued thinning. And I think that may relate to the, the kind of static um, and relatively stable extent, minimum extent over the last few years where, you know, the, the multi-year ice is still holding out, but it's getting thinner and maybe we'll see another step down. Um, Cause you know, basically you're, you're seeing the surface area not changing, but underneath it's getting thinner and eventually some more of the ice will potentially reach the threshold where it can melt out in a in a summer uh in a summer melt season and we might see a sudden another fairly big drop um in the coming years i don't know when that would be but um it seems like that's a, a reasonable thing to think about yeah interesting uh great so that takes us to half past the hour so we'll switch over to the second talk so thanks so much walt that was great uh, I was, I'm just going to add, there is another question in the chat, but perhaps we'll can, or people can answer that while uh, Alan speaks, just to keep things moving. Yeah, oh, I can uh, answer in chat. Yeah, from Matt. Do we see any trends in widespread broken up ice slash penetration of waves into the late summer pack ice with these low minimum September extents since 2007? Walt, did you maybe want to take a stab at that? I, I, I can just quickly, I don't want to cut into Ellen's time, okay. but, um, okay. you know, I, I, I don't know of any data for specifically. We did see 2012, the, the storm that went in that really broke up the ice where the waves really penetrated in. That was an extreme case, but um, and I would guess that maybe there would be more penetration, but I haven't seen specific data that shows that. So. Okay. Uh, great. Ellen, we, I think we have your, the wrong screen. So if you could just switch screens, we can see your presenter view. Okay, hold on. <laughs> I didn't change anything since we tested this out. I know. <laughs> <laughs> Why are you guys there? Uh, oh, that looks safe. Yeah, that looks better. Yeah. Okay, Perfect. cool. Okay, so thanks for having me. Uh, I'm Ellen Buckley, for those who don't know me, and I finished my PhD this spring at University of Maryland working with Sinead Farrell, and now I am a postdoc at Brown, um, and I'm working with Monica martinez Wilhelmus. The work that I'm going to be talking about today is like basically my PhD work, um, and it's about the evolution of Arctic summer sea ice melt from remote sensing observations, and uh, Walt just talked about the 2022 um summer season and end of summer extent but we're going to go back in time and look at um 2020 because that's when this um, analysis is done um and then just acknowledging my co-authors i've worked with a lot of people um i don't know if you can see my mouse um worked with a lot of people on this work um Sinead and uta uh uta kind of led a lot of the uh, melt pond tracking and then her team at um university of colorado boulder Lynn and Tom, and then um, at Maryland, Olivia and Kyle have been really helpful in this work. Um, okay, so a little bit of background. Um, this is, I feel like the, the motivation slide for a lot of sea ice uh, presentations, but looking at the end of summer sea ice area here, um, 
this is uh, the CMIP6 uh, model projections here, and you can see there's still a widespread in uh, predictions of end of summer sea ice, um, even in like the newest model simulations. So that kind of suggests that there's still some processes that are not like well represented or well understood in models, like among other things. Um, but that's why we're looking at these processes that may not be well understood, such as like subgrid cell processes like melt evolution, melt pond formation, um, and the melt ponds form in the summer as the snow melts. Can you see my mouse? No. Okay, that's fine. Um, so um, when uh, the snow melts, these melt ponds form, they form differently depending on the ice on which they form. So um, that middle figure looking at first year ice, the melt ponds can spread a lot across the surface because there's not a lot of deformation features that would obstruct the melt water across the surface. And then on multi-year ice, they're kind of more constrained by these ridges and deformed ice. And instead these drainage channels form that connect um, the melt ponds. Um, and because they look differently and they're not like fully captured by a lot of parameterizations, it's important to understand what's actually happening, especially as we see the Arctic transitioning from like a multi-year ice uh, region, or predominantly multi-year ice in the, in the past to now seeing more and more first-year ice. Um, but again, it's hard to measure melt ponds because they're in the middle of the Arctic. It's dangerous going out there, expensive um, for in-situ studies and then remote sensing. It's hard to like really um, see what is happening um, for a number of reasons. First of all, um, there's a lot of clouds in the Arctic. So a lot of these like imagery is obstructed by clouds. And then um, again, there's not high enough, uh, not a lot of high resolution Arctic wide observations from remote sensing platforms that are able to resolve these small features. Small ponds are like on the order of, well, tens to hundreds of meters in width. So um, sub, uh, sub grid for, for uh, observations as well. And then um, there's limited coverage, even from uh, some remote sensing, these higher resolution products like Sentinel-2, um, kind of limited here. And then um, an altimetry uh, is, so a lot of these like um, algorithms that are used to extract information from the sea ice are kind of obstructed by this melting surface because in a lot of radiometry, um, the melt signal is similar to open water. So it's hard to distinguish between melt ponds and like leads for altimetry. And then um, for uh, ice type, the melt signal again um, kind of confounds the algorithms that can distinguish between different ice types. So luckily though, we have some new um, remote sensing capabilities that have allowed us to look a little bit closer at the melting sea ice surface in the summer. Um, and and so the, what I'm gonna talk about is um, two different methods that we have for um, looking at the CI surface during the melt season from imagery and then also from altimetry. So in that way, kind of getting a 3D um, look at the CI surface. And then um, in the third part, um, putting it all together and looking at melt evolution in this specific um, multi-year ice region uh, in 2020. So kind of like a case study of how we can look at the sea ice in the summer in 3D. Um, and then in the last part, talking about uh, future work and remaining questions that we have. Okay, so we've developed this image classification algorithm that's for high resolution uh, sea ice melt imagery. Um, and it can be done with the red, green, and blue band. So for like images from IceBridge, um, that is just true color imagery, RGB imagery, um, or for multispectral imagery. So like Worldview and Sentinel-2, we include this near infrared band that can help us distinguish between water and ice. Um, and so we have this pixel-based classification algorithm. And so every individual pixel in these high resolution images are classified as ice, open water, melt pond, or um, in the case of larger pixel size like Sentinel-2, which is 10 meter resolution, we have this other category that uh, kind of encapsulates the, the mixed pixels. Um, but yeah, so taking a look at uh, these high resolution images throughout the summer. So this is Worldview 2 and Worldview 3 imagery and kind of just like looking and seeing um, how the classification algorithm works throughout the summer. So in, in early June, um, we don't see a lot of melt on the surface and high sea ice concentration here. And then we start seeing melt ponds forming, evolving, growing, um, and then towards 
August, we're seeing these melt ponds uh, melt through the surface and there's little pockets of open, what's classified as open water because um, it's essentially the melt pond melted through the sea ice and the open ocean is exposed or the ocean is exposed. And then um, the, at the beginning of freeze up, the algorithm is uh, seeing these uh, ponds with lids on it. And especially with the use of that near infrared band, um, it's once there's ice on this on the pond surface, it's being classified as ice again. Um, so, so yeah, red here is, I should have a color bar for this, but red here is the ice and then yellow is melt pond, blue is open water. Um, yeah, so from this way, we can look at these high resolution worldview images. These are like sub two meter resolution, um, but they are commercial imagery and not like widespread, they're kind of tasked. So, um, we have um, looked more at Sentinel-2 images. Um, and so these are 10 meter resolution, again, multi-spectral, um, and they are um, widely available um, up to like 84 degrees north and like 20 kilometers from the coastline. Um, so that, that mostly covers the multi-year ice region. That's why we were focused on the multi-year ice region for um, our study. But again, uh, this is a full Sentinel-2 tile, so large tiles, and then zooming in more and more, we can classify the imagery and again, pick out melt ponds, um, open water areas. And then uh, here it's looking like the edges of the ice are classified as other or mixed pixels. So pixels that contain both ice and open water. Um, Okay, so moving on to part two, the methodology for the altimetry and what that can tell us about melt ponds, about melt ponds in the summer. So um, ISAT-2 launched in 2018. So the first uh, melt season was 2019, but we had um, some data missing from July. Um, so 2020 was the, the first year of like continuous data from ISAT-2, um, but here, Looking at, so it's a photon counting laser altimeter if you're not familiar with it. So each individual photon that's returned to the instrument is geotagged um, and located individually. And so you can see strong returns from what's the sea ice surface and then um, some subsurface scattering. And it's also polar day, so there's a, there's a solar background. Um, but then when you get to a melt pond, you can see that there's returns from the surface. And as it's a green light, it's able to penetrate the water and give you returns from the bottom of the pond. So you can see the surface and the bottom of the pond. Um, and that can give you a lot of information about the pond, like the pond width and the pond depth. Um, and yeah, just generally really high resolution, great detail at the sea ice surface. And this particular pond here, we've um, we validated with looking at coincidence sentinels to imagery. And you can see um, the ice at two track going right over this pond. And that's, that's uh, exactly what it's measuring. Um, and so a higher level product other than the geolocated photons uh, is ATL07, which is designed to track the sea ice surface um, and just one surface though. So it doesn't track two surfaces. So when it comes upon a melt pond, it'll either track, um, well, it'll either track the bottom of the pond depending on the photon density or the top of the pond. Um, or sometimes jumps in between. Uh, so <laughs> it's a great product, but not necessarily made for tracking melt ponds. Um, and also is that is that a resolution that might not capture all melt ponds. So it ranges from 25 meters to about, about 25 meters to 200 meters um, for each ATL07 segment. Um, so not designed to capture melt ponds. So we need to figure out an algorithm or a way to capture that melt pond information from this high resolution product where you can see that there are melt ponds. So um, we've worked on two different algorithms to track the melt ponds um, surface and bathymetry. First, I'll talk about the density dimension algorithm, which is where a team at uh, University of Colorado comes in. They've developed this family of algorithms uh, called the density dimension algorithms and they've been used for a lot of different um, tr surface tracking in um, these photon clouds like uh, crevasses and glaciers and um, like cloud layers but here um, it's able to i'm sorry if this isn't super clear this is a lot of information on one side but um, it's the red and the green in these images in these second panels so it tracks the surface in high detail 
and then um, comes back. It like notices where there's two surfaces, and then it'll come back and track the secondary surface. So it'll track the the surface of the melt pond, and then in the second pass, it tracks the bathymetry of the melt pond. Um, and this has worked really well because it's it, it's automatically applied to the photon cloud, and it can track these surfaces without any manual inputs, just um, some parameters that need to be tuned. Um, and then the other algorithm that we've developed was kind of just for like a first look at melt ponds, but um, the University of Maryland melt pond algorithm, and that is that required me looking through a lot of photon clouds and manually finding melt ponds and um, then running this algorithm that will track the surface in the bottom. Um, but you can see they kind of like line up pretty well um, because it's just based on photon densities. Um, so from here we have the surface and the bathymetry. And then if you difference these two surfaces, you can get melt pond depth. And then this also gives you information about melt pond width. Um, so we've used these two algorithms to like extract a lot of information from these uh, laser altimetry measurements. Um, okay, so now getting into part three, um, which is the kind of like the case study here. So um, we looked at the multi-year ice region in 2020. It said 2020 because it was a year of anomalous melt. There was really high temperatures in May and uh, early onset of ponding. Um, and then multi-year ice region because, um, well, ponds are, in terms of the altimetry, ponds are easier to measure on multi-year ice because that multi-year ice is thicker and so you're more likely to have, um, be able to see the bottom of the pond before it melts through. Um, and they're deep enough too. I should mention that um, the pulse width of the ice at two is about like 22 centimeters. So that's the minimum pond depth that we can retrieve just based on the instrument limitations. Um, okay, so this is a multi-year ice region. Um, and here we can see all the DDA tracked ponds. We only ran on about 10% of the available data just as like a feasibility. Um, and because it takes a long time. Um, but uh, you can see all the locations of the melt ponds in each of these tracks in green. And then um, the manually identified ponds are in black. Um, that, and those are the ones that tracked with the MPA. And then uh, the ones that we both tracked um, are in gold. Um, yeah. Um, so looking at the ones that we've both tracked, kind of making sure we're looking at the same thing. Uh, we found good agreement in the in the depths that were derived from these ponds. Um, there's a little bit of spread across this, but um, pretty good agreement. About four centimeters deeper, the the, the MPA ponds are than the DDA ponds. Um, but yeah, for that reason, we uh, combined all of the data sets when we looked at like the full evolution of um, the ponds. Um, Sorry, jumping back and forth here. <laughs> now looking at Sentinel-2 results. So we looked at um, over 1,700 Sentinel-2 tiles. Um, so spread out over a, a, like a really large area. And we looked at uh, the, the melt season. So from June 15th through, or sorry, June 1st through September 15th. Um, and then with the classification algorithm, we're able to look at the different aerial fractions of each of these surface types. So um, again, red is ice, and then yellow is melt pond, and blue is open water, and then green is this other category. Um, and so, um, so we're looking at how these different surfaces evolve throughout the summer. So the, the ice kind of decreases rapidly here, and then um, kind of becomes lower. So th this is, um, starts at 60%, so it's not that dramatic, but a little bit more variability in the ice concentration, which would be just like the ice fraction. Um, and then uh, the largest area of yellow, you can see the melt pond fraction is highest in late June. Um, and then open water is kind of related to those other two categories. Um, but then putting it all together and looking at how these different variables are related to each other and how they evolve throughout time. Again, looking from June 1st through September 15th, uh, sea ice concentration starts out consistently high and then decreases and then increases again towards the end of the melt season um, in this region. And it's not it's not exactly what you would expect to see with that like swoop down and then back up. Um, and that's 
that's because these, these regions are being sampled differently, um, kind of depending on cloudiness. Um, so I should note that the background of all of these is like the total area analyzed um, for the Sentinel-2 drive products and then the total pond count. Um, and you can see there's like a gap in all the data right here. And that's like a area of um, it, this, this time period was like particularly cloudy. Um, and so in the second panel, looking at melt pond fraction, you can see like a slow increase here. And then when you come to this cloudiness weather system, that likely like enhanced the melt. And that's right after that, when you start seeing data again, um, this is when you're seeing like peak melt pond fraction. Again, this is only at like 15% um, because it's multi-year ice um, and then kind of decreasing again um, throughout the rest of the melt season. Um, yeah, so, and then pond depth, again, this is all of the uh, ponds we've tracked both with, with both algorithms combined, um, seeing a slow increase um, in pond depth and uh, increasing up until mid-July um, and then decreasing again and becoming more variable. The, this is it might look different from uh, um, different in situ studies because instead of looking at individual ponds evolved, you're kind of averaging these different processes that may be occurring at different times in um, areas across this like really large region. So this is an average of all the processes. This isn't representative of a single pond or a, a small area. Um, right, so something to note about this though is that um, even as melt pond fraction is decreasing here, uh, melt pond depth is increasing. So that's interesting to think about when we look at these in situ studies. So this is a figure from <clears throat> Melinda Webster's paper um, and or a yeah, paper that she led that uh, and we're showing uh, Sheba in these circles here. So this is the Sheba line um, showing melt pond fraction versus melt pond depth. So I should mention that. Um, seeing how they evolve together. Um, and this is important because some model parameterizations are based on this relationship between fraction and depth. Um, and so looking at how Shiba evolves, um, there's like this nice linear relationship between the two throughout the majority of the melt season. <clears throat> um, and then they also looked at uh, mosaic, which is here down here in the squares. And they they see that a little bit in the beginning, but like not as much um, <laughs> throughout the the main part of the melt season or the middle to the end part of the melt season, they see it kind of jumping around a bit. Um, so maybe maybe this parameterization that's based on Sheba results from 20 years ago is, is not fully representative of the whole Arctic. And so we looked at that in our study region as well. Um, I didn't have connecting lines because it was crazy, but uh, the, dark, the darkest ones are the beginning of the melt season. And then you can see pond depth increasing, pond fraction increasing. There is kind of a relationship here. But then pond fraction begins to decrease um, as depth still increases and then depth decreases, comes back. Um, so that's an interesting relationship um, to kind of think about uh, in terms of when you're looking at model outputs, how representative uh, you, you would want some observations that are representative of like the entire Arctic instead of like particular studies or study regions. Um, Okay, I think, okay, I'm still getting time. Um, another thing we looked at is melt pond size distribution. Um, and this is kind of, I, I, the main reason we looked at this is to kind of understand what these lower resolution, they're still high resolution for um, satellite products, but lower resolution compared to like in situ studies or um, airborne studies. Um, so the effect of these larger pixel sizes in Sentinel-2 and worldview and um, the resolution of ice sat too, and how, like what percentage of melt ponds can they actually resolve um, based on the limitations in um, like the widths and the depths that they can um, capture. So this is based on the imagery, but um, from the imagery, we kind of just assumed that melt ponds were circular and um, looked at pond area and the probability. So uh, this is recreated based on like some some previous literature so that we could compare to that. But um, also, if you look at like the cumulative distribution, you can um, look at the resolution of um, Sentinel-2, which is uh, the individual pixel sizes 
uh, 10, 10 meters by 10 meters. So this is the, the smallest small pond you can measure here. So you're missing all of this data. Um, and then the DDA, the density dimension algorithm, I didn't mention this, but the minimum width that it can resolve is seven and a half meters. Um, and so that corresponds to like 45 uh, square meters in area. And so it's missing this small part of the distribution. Um, but if you're looking at the MPA algorithm, it's missing like a really large portion of the melt ponds and only measuring those really deep melt ponds um, because the, the really deep and wide melt ponds. Um, so that's just something interesting to think about when you think about limitations and designing an algorithm that's that can capture all the information that you're interested in. <laughs> okay, so for remaining questions, um, I have a lot of remaining questions, and then I have two more slides. Usually this is your final slide, but um, I, okay, these are high resolution Arctic wide um, data sets. So what other information do we need from them and what other um, applications can these have? Like, I feel like as a remote sensing scientist, there's a lot of time spent making products, but uh, it's important to think about who we're making products for and what they really need them and how to format them and what aspects of the ice to look at. Um, and then also we've created a lot of algorithms that um, can be scaled up, applied to different data sets. That image classification algorithm can be applied to um, any high resolution imagery in the summer. Um, so it's been applied to ice bridge imagery, worldview and uh, Sentinel-2. Um, and then as for the ISAT-2 tracking, surface tracking algorithms, um, it, uh, I think it would be really great. And I think that's one of the goals of um, the ISAT-2 Project Science Office to create an algorithm that can um, systematically pull out these melt pond depths um, to kind of create a, a new data product for that. Um, and then, okay, yeah, also thinking about how, how these products can better inform model parameterizations. I talked a little bit about um, what some model parameterizations are based off of, but um, like, again, how can we like format this data that's better for modeling and also what can models tell us about what kind of observations we need. So, so thinking about these different model inter comparison projects, um, if you, we look at the regions where there's like the largest vari variation between models, that's where we can focus our observations or our studies. Um, so kind of connecting again with the modeling community to kind of work towards understanding the summer Arctic better. Um, and then I'm ending with this last point how can we validate these measurements of summer sea ice? Because um, I'm going to talk about a little bit about the ice set to validation campaign. Um, <clears throat> this was conducted in July this year. There were six total science flights, um, all ice set two under flights. And um, one of them was cryo ice. The one that's um, the westernmost one was the cryo ice one. And uh, they had a high altitude and a, a low altitude um, altimetry and then a high resolution camera. Um, and the goals of this campaign was to validate I said two products, um, both uh, ATL is seven, and then also um, think about methods for melt pond depth recovery. Um, okay, so yeah, there's three instruments at least uh, uh, one of which was this low at altitude bathmetric lidar that was that was meant for measuring melt pond depth. Um, it's a green lidar, so it can penetrate the the uh, the water column, and it also had a um, infrared um, wavelength as well. And then the Elvis was used as the high altitude topographic lidar, and then it also had Elvis also has this high resolution camera, and these quick look um, products that I'm showing on the right are now available as of like a few days ago. Um, but yeah, looks like we have some good results and it's exciting to see like what is gonna come from um, these products. Uh, yeah, so that's all I have um, for now, but I'll go back to this slide and um, we can talk. Great, thanks so much, Ellen. Uh, we'll open it up to questions again. We've got a few minutes left here. Anyone with a burning question about melt, melt ponds? Uh, 
I've given this presentation like 10 times, so maybe everyone's already seen it and asked all their questions already. <laughs> I, th I think I missed Ellen, just if you could go back a couple of slides where the um, where this um, the pond size data came from. Oh, um, this is from World View 2 uh, classification. So this is, yeah, I didn't say this, you didn't miss it. Um, this is from 20 worldview two and three images and it's from classifying them and then um gotcha. uh, yeah again it's it has a lot of assumptions in it like assuming that milk ponds are circular which they aren't yeah. but um yeah and then maybe just another quick question unless oh someone else has a question i'll let them go yeah we'll let uh petra hey thanks guys uh thanks ellen um perhaps uh you haven't worked on that, but um, I would be interested. Have you looked at all uh, in the Antarctic uh, uh, using these methods uh, for male pond investigations? I guess it's a different issue, different physics, but it would be interesting to get your view on that. Thanks. Yeah, I mean, I haven't, I haven't looked at that. I imagine there would be a lot of different, um, uh, different things to consider. Um, like, what are melt ponds in the Antarctic? And I. I I'm not really sure what the the ice at two return would look like over the, that melting snow on Antarctic sea ice, um, and then I guess it would be harder for classification of imagery because um, I would imagine the melt ponds aren't as like stark um, with all that extra snow on Antarctic sea ice, <laughs> I guess. But I yeah. I know that they there are people that have looked at um, like melt streams in Antarctica um, using like similar methodology, especially with ice at two. Um, being able to track the surface and the and the bottom of the melt stream, um, but for mm -hmm. melt ponds, yeah, I think that would be harder because they're not as well defined when they exist. Also, yeah, <laughs> yeah. something to keep up your sleeve. Thanks. Nice work. Thanks. Thanks. That brings us to the top of the hour. So I think we'll wrap it up there just to just to stick to the time. Uh, there was one slide there from Andre. Andre, perhaps you can reach out to Ellen, or maybe Ellen can can look at the chat and re respond there. Um, so that brings us to the end of the first um, CI session. So thanks everyone for taking part. We reached 40 viewers at the peak. So that's awesome, awesome attendance. Uh, I just wanted to quickly plug next week, the IGS seminar series will continue with a, a presentation here from Liz Morris from the University of Cambridge. Um, in uh, the next sea ice talk will take place on October 26th. As I mentioned, we have Letty Roach presenting on Antarctic sea ice and Kent Moore focusing on Arctic sea ice. Again, another thing that we'd like to try to do in this, in this seminar series is really highlight work at both poles. Um, myself and Alec are coming at it more from an Arctic perspective. Uh, Alex dabbled in, in a bit of both. And then Petra is coming at it from the Antarctic. So we'd like to ensure that we cover both poles. Uh, and then November 30th, we've got Vishnu and Will. Uh, if, again, if anyone would like to volunteer to talk, shoot me an email and I will add you to our list of speakers for 2023. And of course, there's more information and links on the IGS website. And lastly, I'll just uh, promote this one more time. This is the, an early look at the IGS Symposium on Sea Ice that's going to take place in Bremerhaven in Germany in June 2023 next year. Uh, and we'll be providing more information as we get closer to that. So thanks so much, everyone. And if you do have any questions, please feel free to reach out to myself or Alec or Petra or follow up with our speakers via email as well. So thanks, everyone. And we'll see you in a few weeks. Thanks guys, that was great.